Hey, Smart Pack fans. I'm Smart Packer Dan. She's Dr. Lydia Gray, Smart Pack staff veterinarian and medical director. And we're here to answer horse health questions asked and voted on by you. Now, I know last month we did promise that we would be out of the studio for this episode. We did. But unfortunately, the weather did not get that message. So unfortunately, <laughs> due to weather conditions, we did have to cancel that. Oh, so. Right back where we usually are. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll make it up to you by showing you a wonderful photo of Dr. Gray driving two minis. <laughs> this does not put a smile on your face to start your day. It put a smile on my face <laughs> and my navigator's face. I know. You look like you're absolutely enjoying yourself How so much. How can you not with <laughs> Pippin and Bilbo? I mean, they're adorable. What are their names again? Pippin and Bilbo. Very cute. The they're so adorable. Yeah. But you do actually have a little bit of a change in your horse life right now. A little bit taller. <laughs> yeah. But we will cover more of that as we get closer okay. to question number four. We don't want to spoil okay. it for you, but it's a good one. <laughs> we'll be very excited for you. So not to delay the process, let's drive right into question number one. So this was asked by Sierra on YouTube, and she would like to know, should I give my horse mineral oil to keep her from getting colic? That's you look shocked. I, I was shocked. The short answer is no. That's what um, I figured you were going to say. Yep, yep, <laughs> and, and I'll tell you why. So first, let me though let me read a definition I found of mineral oil, okay. which is also known as liquid petrolatum. I mean, the name just sounds awful, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, a purified mixture of semi-solid hydrocarbons obtained from petroleum, used as a base for ointments, protective dressings, and soothing applications to the skin, um, called also petroleum jelly. Mm. I mean. Doesn't sound like something yeah. you really want to. So there's no evidence that daily, I don't know if she was intending daily, regular, let's call it, administration of mineral oil to horses orally, mm -hmm. ha having them adjusted, uh, prevents colic, right? Okay. And there's actually not a ton of evidence that when your horse colics and the vet comes out and administers mineral oil by nasogastric or stomach tube, we're, we're getting away from that. And now we're still putting the tube in because the tube itself is diagnostic because there's fluid in there that needs to come out because, mm -hmm. you know, horses can't vomit. Yes. But we're putting more water in, we're putting saline in, electrolytes, and we find that those agents or those um, just water softens impactions and gets things moving again much better than mineral oil did. Okay, because I was going to say, I know commonly we've had horses colic. That usually used to be the standard kind of protocol. Yeah, we're moving away from that. Okay. We're moving away from that. Um, Learn something new. Y yeah, yeah. And it's it's not, it's it's a slow thing because it's been, it's been very traditional mm -hmm. for many years. But um, we're just, we're finding, there's research now that says, you know what? There's better outcomes when we just put water or electrolyte salt water in. Nice. So. Um, there's a reason. There's there's some bad things that happen when you give min mineral oil. It because it's um, it doesn't get digested or absorbed, and it has no nutritive value. Mm -hmm. It can actually uh, prevent the absorption of fat soluble vitamins, oh. A D E K. Okay. So long term, daily or regular use would prevent nutrient absorption. It can also prevent absorption of medications. So it would have an impact in another way. Absolutely. Negative. And and it's used, it makes sense, because it's used for certain um, fat-soluble toxins. Mm -hmm. It can be given to block their absorption. Mm. So it, it blocks the absorption of things, good and bad. So if the horse has that through their digestive system, not yeah. a good thing. Yeah. So, and, and the other thing is there's more important, more appropriate uh, diet and management strategies that we can use because we know the proven risk factors for colic, yes. like um, hay changes, grain changes, uh, abrupt changes in exercise, like stalling when they were used to being out or exercised a lot. Um, and it, much better to focus on those that we know that that work than things that are you know old wives' tales or rumors or there's no proof behind. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And then the final thing I want to say is that you never uh, force mineral oil down a horse. And they're not going to eat enough in like their pan to make a difference. Mm -hmm. um, and some people get tempted to, well, I'm going to take a, a big oral dosing syringe and, and put, you know, some in. And that's a problem because if they aspirate it or get it down the wrong pathway, if they get it into their lungs, it could be really serious, even fatal. Oh. So never, never dose syringe, never orally syringe a horse with mineral oil. 
let's not do that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, well, we've done lots of episodes about colic before. Like you mm -hmm. said, there's also all these risk factors yeah. and other ways we can help support them. So we'll definitely put the links in the description for you guys for those, so you can check all those out, right. all those resources for exactly. you. Exactly. Awesome. Well, on to question number two, and this was submitted by Megan on the SmartPack blog at blog.smartpack.com. And Megan wants to know, how much loose salt should I feed daily? I live in Florida, so my horse occasionally sweats and seems to not drink much. Please help. So, did you take some sort of chemistry when you were in college? Mm, I probably try to avoid that as one of my sciences. Okay, well, <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna do a chem one on one here today. Okay, perfect. And a little bit of math. Okay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, according to the NRC, which I quote probably almost every video, it's the nutrient requirements of horses. Um, a horse just standing in a pasture and eating and blinking and breathing needs 10 grams of sodium a day. 10 grams of sodium a day. Okay. If that horse is uh, in heavy work, is exercising and sweating then up to like 40 grams, so four times as much. Wow. Yeah. Now, there's very little sodium and chloride, for that matter, in the horse's regular natural diet, mm -hmm. like hays and pastures and grains. There's just not a lot of salt, not like human food. Yeah. You know, ours <laughs> is loaded with it. And then we should say that salt, the term, is made up of sodium and chloride. Yes. Okay. See? I did take that. <laughs> okay, maybe I did take chemistry. Okay, I'm in. And then now, now it's where it gets hard. There is about, if you look at a molecule of salt, which is sodium and chloride, 40% mm -hmm. of that molecule is sodium. Okay. And 60% is chloride. Okay. You with me? I'm with you. 40, okay. 60, gotcha. Okay. <laughs> so if I am trying to give my horse, um, if I give him 10 grams of salt, mm. how many grams of sodium am I, get, am He's I giving? He's only getting 40% of that. So four. Yes. Right. And I wasn't going to do the math. I could okay, only okay. take 40%. <laughs> yeah. So, so how do I get 10 grams of sodium in my horse? Mm. Doing the math, I have to give him about 28 grams of salt. Okay. Okay. That's about an ounce. Okay. So one ounce of salt. And roughly two tablespoons. Okay. So we'll make this super practical. I can do those things. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's what she wanted to know. Now, the problem with salt is, and I'm sure you've experienced this, back in the day when, when we filled up a salt shaker, we put a little rice kernel in mm -hmm. it, right? Because salt is hygroscopic. I love when you use big words in the morning. It means, in the morning, <laughs> it means it attracts water from the air. Okay. And so if you, once you open your, you know, Morton container of salt in the barn, really soon it just turns into a big hard rock yes. and you can't use it. So the better thing to do is we put salt in pellets to make them tastier mm -hmm. and last longer and be more stable in the environment. And you can also buy them at Smart Packs yeah. and even better. And so that's, I think it's called Smart Salt Pellets. Yep. And that would be the ideal way to get your horse's daily salt requirement into him with no moss, no fuss. Because even sometimes just like top dressing with loose salts Sometimes it falls to the bottom of the pan, or like horse maybe doesn't like it as much. So yeah. it makes it a little bit more palatable yeah. for them. And then a lot of people are like, well, I'm just going to set out a, a salt block, one of mm -hmm. those big 50 pounders. But those are made for cattle, rough tongues. And some horses, now some horses lick them just fine. Yeah. Um, but even those horses, you don't know how much they're licking. It's like in their full requirement. Yeah. And then there's horses who are like, oh, my tongue, you know, I don't want to. So they don't, they don't lick them. And then they're not getting their daily requirement of salt. So I like her idea of um, loose salt, providing or top dressing salt in some form. Mm -hmm. And smart salt pellets is a great way to do it. Okay. So at least an ounce a day to get your guy going. Yeah. There seems like there should be a saying in there somewhere. We'll, come we'll up work with on it. it for the next episode. <laughs> <laughs> but in the meantime, on to question number three. And this was submitted by Kate on the Smart Pack blog. So every summer, my horse and other horses at the barn start with slobbers from red clover. Is there anything that can help slow down the amount of drooling without limiting the horse's turnout? So I think I'm going to have some ideas for her. I think the answer might be yes. But first, I want to make sure that everybody who's watching is on the same page. Yes. Um, so slobbers is the, the name that we give to these, this condition we see in horses. When they eat uh, a type of plant in the family of the legumes, um, legumes are, you, you think of alfalfa, mm -hmm. all right? Clovers, I think she mentioned red clover. Yep. Uh, there's white clover, there's alcyc, there's, and then my favorite legume, lespedeza. <laughs> of course. <laughs> of course. Um, so you, you, these types of plants, these legumes, 
when there's certain conditions like high humidity, they, a fungus can grow on them. Mm. And the fungus produces a mycotoxin called slaphermine. Slaphermine, okay. And so slaphermine poisoning is also referred to as slobber. Okay, gotcha. And we, it's, you know, slaphermine poisoning sounds terrible. Yes. This is m mostly a nuisance. It's not really a, a health threat to horses. It's a, it's a cosmetic thing. Now, if you're, if you, so if your horse is in the barn and you know you're riding it every day, it's it's annoying because they can leave big big puddles of, of <laughs> saliva. But if you're showing, yeah. it's more of a so I can understand. Not a good look. Yeah, it's not a good look. So um, the things that she can do are things that you do in the pasture, and so she may or may not have influence over these. But I'll just I'll just read these. You can, um, and some of these are long-term and some are short-term, but overseed with grass and make sure that you're planting no more than about 40% of, of the legumes. And I, I think I say this too a lot every time. Talk to your county extension agent. They know your area, your geographic area intimately well. They know pasture management. They, they know weather. They know toxin, toxic plants. Uh, they know all that stuff. Yeah. That's their job. So uh, I don't think, I don't think we, to take advantage of. we use them as, as much as we should. Um, you can learn as a horse owner to check legume or clover leaves for this fungus. And so they'll look like black spots or black rings, maybe, maybe just brown or, or gray. Um, and like I said, they, they appear in times of high humidity, but really anytime the pasture is stressed. So pasture gets stressed from too much water, but also too little water. So periods of drought, it's of course. always stressed. <laughs> Um, and also overgrazing, mm -hmm. you know, if a pasture is eaten down. That said, one of the best things you can do to um, uh, re reduce the, um, the, the, how bad this problem gets in horses is to keep the pasture mowed to about no more than three to four inches high. Three, four inches, okay. Because regrowth tends not to harbor the fungus. Oh. So if you keep your pasture low, you'll have less of the fungus and less of the slap. Interesting, okay. So that's something you can do like right then. Um, the phrase that your county extension agent may share is fertilize, rest, and rotate. And you want to fertilize the grass. Okay. Because the clovers and the alfalfas, they take over if the grass doesn't have what it needs to grow more. So you want the grass to keep growing and get provided? Legumes. Yeah, otherwise the, the, the legumes will tend to take over. Um, the bullies, <laughs> and then, um, but resting the pasture so it's not stressed. Mm -hmm. And one way to rest it is to rotate. So if you have um, two pastures, you can use one and not use one, and that's good because you're you're letting it grow, letting it even out again. Uh, you can mow it, you can remove the manure, mm -hmm. you know. So I'm thinking about parasites. <laughs> um, in in last resort, then you have to pull the horses, and I know this was not what she wanted to do, but yeah. pull the horses and put them on a dry lot, feed them hay. Now, hay, if it's made with legumes, can also have slaphermine in it. However, like uh, vitamin E and some other things, slaphermine also degrades After a, through time as the hay is cut and stored. So it will be less than the um, living grass. Okay, so those are definitely some options depending if, you know, she's boarding your horse, you might have a little bit less control yeah. over the pasture, but if nothing else, you can always do dry lot with hay if yeah. that worst case yeah. comes to worst case. And the last thing I would say is um, don't assume that just because your horse is hypersalivating that it is slobbers. Maybe the first time, unless you experience this every year and you know your horse has it, and not every horse will do it. Mm -hmm. Some some are more sensitive to slaphermine, and it also it depends on your preference for grazing. Like if you prefer to eat grass, you're probably not going to run into this. Yeah. But if you're a, a clover seeker, then you're getting a heavier load of it. Um, but have the vet out at least the first time and make sure that slobbers is what you're dealing with and it's not choke, which is very serious and could be life threatening. That it's not a, a some sort of trauma or a dental disease or. There's other things your vet can rule out, and but really it's a it's a it's a chronic over time thing. Mm. Every day you see it, so that that's one of the clues that it's slobbers. But your vet can help you, you know, narrow down. Say, yep, it's for sure. Confirm it. Awesome. Well, hopefully those tips were helpful for you, and let us know how your horse does with some of these management tips. So on to question number four. So this is the one we've been waiting for. Dun, dun, dun. So your new and exciting news. 
I bought a horse. Finally, congratulations. <laughs> I know it's been a long road. It's, um, it took, I started in April, and so what's this, May, June, July, August, September, I don't even know what month it is, yeah. five or six months, yeah. But yeah. I, knew, I knew what I wanted, I knew what I didn't want, and I was patient, and I sort of stuck to my standards. That's, so tell us a little bit about him. Uh, so his name, his registered name, he's a Dutch Warmblood. Okay. He's two years old. <laughs> his uh, registered name is Modelo, and, but he was born during the Stanley Cup, so they called him Stanley. Stanley. Well, no, they called him Stanley. Oh, okay. And then I met him and I said, I think you're more like Stan Lee, <laughs> the Marvel Comics legend, because he's kind of an old soul. And uh, last week I called him Grandpa Stan because, Aww. because he was telling the older horses to behave. <laughs> you were saying that. You were saying mm -hmm. that, like, you have to turn him out first because mm -hmm. like, he, like, sets an example for the older horses. Yep, he's the best outside in the pasture. He's not got the sillies. He's the best loader. He's the best in the, the wash stall. I mean, That's he's, so lucky for two years old. <laughs> he's a really good example. Well, the, the, the breeder, and the, she handled him from birth and just did a fabulous job nice. with him. So my job is not to screw with that. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, it sounds good. What are you guys going to be doing together? What are your goals? Everything. Of course. Um, and his main job is to be a, a dressage horse mm -hmm. and hopefully upper levels because he's his bred to be. I mean, his sire and his damn sire are both Grand Prix dressage horses. But he'll drive, um, he'll do some side saddle, he'll do some jumping, working equitation. But he's a little on the big side. He's, he's pretty tall. Two years old, and he's already 16 too. And she I showed us the photo and I, I was. I string tested him and it's, I'm like, I threw it away because I didn't want to know, but he's going to be a big boy. <laughs> well, we are excited to hear how you guys do going forward yeah. as you guys start working together. Yeah. So that does lead us into question number four, though, which was submitted by Autumn Softpaw on YouTube. And she wants to know why are pre purchase slash adopt vet checks so important? What health things do vets typically search for when doing an examination of a horse that someone is going to buy? And what happens if the the horse doesn't pass a vet check. So you probably have had a lot of experience with <laughs> this last couple of months. I did. I went, this is, this was, Stan is the 12th horse I looked at. Wow. Yeah, which is not a ton, but um, I did three pre-purchases along the way. Mm -hmm. um, clearly, uh, there were two that didn't pass the vet check, and I'm air quoting because we don't really talk anymore in terms of passing or failing. Yeah. It's more like what the vet found today, that the snapshot uh, I, I, what was identified today, m medical issues and, and any maybe soundness issues, um, can I live with them? Can I manage them? Mm -hmm. Is the horse suitable for what I want to do with them? Yes. So it's very important that the veterinarian you choose for your pre-purchase exam. And I, I recommend you choose, um, the buyer choose the vet, and don't just go with the seller's vet. It's a bit of a conflict of interest, um, there are paperwork and things you can sign and conversations you have to uh, reduce that risk. But I, because the horse I bought was local, I was able to use one of the vets that I, same one of the vets that I use for, for my regular horse. And um, I know him very well. And I was able to, on the other ones also, halt the pre purchase at any time. Mm. As soon as I saw something that I could not live with or I knew I couldn't manage or was not going to allow me to go as far as I wanted to with the horse, I just said, we're done. Yeah. So um, that's really helpful to both be there and to work with the vet that you know. But to your point, like I think being realistic about what your goals are, what you really want to do, and are you going to be able to manage whatever the vet happens to find. Yeah. So here's an example. The When we're doing the pre-purchase on Stan, um, he's going over it, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about, we'll, we'll make sure we'll answer all her questions. but. Um, he got to the ears and he's looking in, and you know these things called aural plaques, mm -hmm. the little white lesions on the inside. He saw quite a few of them and he looks at me horrified. He says, he's got aural plaques. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> keep going. Yeah. Because I, that's a problem that I am willing to deal with. Yeah. He's, he wasn't head shy. You could put halters, um, he hasn't had a bridle on yet, but it's not gonna be a problem, trust me. Um, he doesn't care that he has white lesions mm -hmm. in his ear. Now, if we were looking at a different horse and you couldn't even touch his ear and you like looked at, at a distance and it's like, I think that's oral plaques, then I maybe would have had a different reaction. More but concern. Stan doesn't know he has oral plaques in his ear and so I, it's not a thing. 
Oh, I'm right. That's a great yeah. idea. Yeah. So um, going to kind of more of her questions. Okay. So what are things? Yeah. Uh, what things do vets typically search for? Okay. So there's two parts really of a, a, a general pre-purchase. There's the the standard physical exam or a general assessment of the horse, and then there's the soundness portion of mm -hmm. it, right? Unless there's caveat, you're you're buying this horse for breeding, mm -hmm. then there's a, another section called a breeding soundness exam. You would skip the, the soundness and go into breeding, breeding. soundness, yeah. Um, so for the standard physical exam, it's it's what you think. It's um, you look at the horse overall, you look at his conformation, his attitude and appearance, uh, and then you go organ system by organ system, and each vet will have their own like flow and paperwork because you want to do it step by step and not miss anything and do it in the same order every time. Okay. So every, every vet will have their own way of, of doing this. But you'll, you'll do a TPR because you want to know if they have a, a fever, if their heart rate and rhythm is correct. But you'll, you'll listen to the heart, you'll listen to the lungs, you assess the skin for health and, and wounds and lumps and bumps. My vet starts with the eyes mm -hmm. because if, if he, he has learned, if he sees a cataract in the eyes, many buyers, that's, that stops it. So it's like, why do the whole rest of the exam if I find something in this test that's going to end it? Yeah. So he looks there. But you, you just go over everything um, really with a fine tooth comb. <laughs> and, and you just point, the vet will point out, they usually have a scribe, like their, their vet tech, their assistant will be writing down things. And they'll be pointing them out as you're standing there and you can talk about them. Um, and, and then from the, the general physical, you would move into the soundness portion of it. And f like for a two-year-old, there wasn't a whole lot we could do. Mm. We were able to look at his conformation, evaluate his hooves. We're looking for symmetry, right? Uh, we're looking for conformational defects that could affect his way of going um, in the dressage ring and just under saddle. Like does he have a club foot? Is yeah. he long in the fetlock? Does yeah. he have, do his, are his legs crooked? Yeah. You know? Um, we couldn't really do, we, we, could, we could watch him walk, trot, and canter, sort of free lunge, right? Mm -hmm. He kind of lunges, but not really. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of just looking at <laughs> yeah. us, like, um, we can't, we couldn't flex him, in, mm. like stand there and hold his leg up, bent for 30 or 60 or 90 seconds, and then trot him out. He's never done that. He doesn't know what to do. So, but, <laughs> but a riding horse, you, you would do that. Um, you might even go under saddle mm -hmm. and, and do what you're going to do and see how the horse does. So we were able to watch him move at all three gates um, and palpate him and look at his conformation and then that was that was about it. Now the thing we did do was take radiographs. Mm. It was important to me that he not have any defects in his um, joints, any chips, mm -hmm. um, any arthritis that would make mean that the final conclusion on the pre-purchase would say uh, suitable for trail riding only, not suitable for upper level dressage. You're like, that wouldn't work for you. Yeah, ya. and that's what I got back on the first two. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm like, well, I just don't, I'm sorry, I don't want to just trail mm. ride, I want to do more athletic stuff, so um, this horse has to be capable. Um, on this, the snapshot that we're taking today, remember the not a crystal yes. ball, but from, there's nothing that, uh, that we saw today that would preclude him from going as high as we want to go. And that's good for you though, because a lot of times, myself I know, when they meet a horse, you fall in love with them, you're like, but he's so cute, he's so pretty, he's so nice, and then you find out like, well, he's not actually built to do anything that you want to do. Yeah. And it's really hard to be like, okay. Objective. Yeah. Well, and that's why people ask me, why don't you just do your own pre-purchase exam? You're a vet. <laughs> <laughs> for exactly the reason that Dan mentioned. I mean, I'm not objective. Once I met this horse, it was like stars in my eyes. <laughs> it's very hard to see when you have stars in your eyes. So I had somebody out who I knew and I trusted to be objective. Yeah. And and he knew I'd be upset if he found anything. I mean, this poor guy, no pressure on him. But um, I'm like, good luck on the You're exam. Like, no Don't pressure and I already love him. <laughs> I've already bought By a way, stall name plate. <laughs> I know, I know. So no, he did he did a great job. My like, that's great. Awesome. Well, we've actually done a lot of videos in the uh, past about new horse ownership. Um, so we'll link those in the description for you as well. And I believe one of your good friends has done some videos for us about pre-purchase exams. Excellent so pre-purchase. And I want to point out that I wrote an article that's in the Horse Health Library about pre-purchase yes. exams. That's, that's very helpful. So if we didn't answer your questions today because we got sidetracked on Stan, um, you happens. can find it in Dr. Canop's video or my article. Awesome, we'll put those links in the description for you. But good luck, Autumn, if you are horse shopping. Let us know how that goes.
So on to our last question, question number five. This was submitted by Jennifer on the Ask the Vet form at smartpack.com slash ask the vet questions. And Jennifer would like to know, I'd like to add alfalfa cubes to my horse's diet, but I'm concerned over blister beetle toxicity. Are hay cubes just as likely to carry blister beetles? And if so, how can you tell which are the good ones to buy? Thanks. It's a great question and I feel um, maybe naive because obviously I'm aware of blister beetles like oh alfalfa alpha, hay yeah. and just never worried about buying cubes or pellets or any other version of them. I just assumed they were quality made. I was thinking the same thing when I read this question <laughs> earlier. Like, I, was like, I, was like, I, thought, I was like oopsies. <laughs> so this answer is for all of us. Um, so blister beetles. Okay. I thought, I'm from Illinois, mm -hmm. and we're in Massachusetts, yes. and I don't know what you think about them, but I always thought they were a western state problem, mm -hmm. and I didn't have to worry about them. Turns out, blister beetles are found throughout the U.S., oh. and they're more common in the east and the south. Whoops. <laughs> Whoops. Whoops. We, we would have failed Thank you for asking this question, Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a couple different species of blister beetles, and the one that is most toxic is the three-striped blister beetle. That does sound pretty intense. It does, and but also easy to recognize them, mm -hmm. right? Because one of the things we'll talk about is you should in, look inspect your hay, mm, okay. if it, not the hay cubes and pellets, but actual just hay. Um, so they produce a substance called cantharidin. That's the toxic agent, and it's it's quite toxic to horses and other species. But horses seem to be particularly sensitive mm. to it. Um, and blister beetle, but with the way it gets its name is. It can blister the, the tongue, the mouth. One of the first signs is horses that don't normally play in their water. Mm. Because it, you can imagine it makes their mouth feel better. It's if you've got blisters and ulcers and things, that they dunk their head in the water and they s aggressively play and splash. You're so, like, something's going on there. That's right, that's yeah. right. So that's one of those things, reasons why you have to know your own horse. Um, but it, it uh, really creates that same blistering and ulcer effect throughout the GI system. Oh, really? So bloody diarrhea is another sign. Oh, A geez. colic is probably the first sign yep. you may see. And it does the same damage to the renal or the urinary tract, to the kidneys. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, so you can see bloody urine. It can kill a horse. If you get a, if you get a, a large amount of blister beetles in there, or the cantharidin, the toxic principle, it can kill a horse in as little as like six hours. Six hours? Yeah. Yeah. So if, you, the, if you're in an area and you're feeding alfalfa, you have to recognize the signs and you have to call your vet. Now, mm. because colic is one of the first signs, and we're calling our vet about colic anyway, yeah. you know, as long as you follow that principle, you're probably okay. Yeah. So, um, we talked about the signs. Things an alfalfa buyer should do is know the supplier. Mm -hmm. So don't just buy alfalfa from anybody because it's gotta be quality. Um, ask what precautions they took to avoid the presence of bleeder, blister beetles in the forage. And s for example, um, I learned that if you harvest your alfalfa before it blooms, okay. it will be less likely to have blister beetles in them. Mm -hmm. If you, your first cutting is, if you can get it done, weather permitting, before May, mm -hmm. and then they, they tend to emerge from the ground in June, July, and August. So if you get your hay before June and after August. You have a better exactly. likelihood. Not, I mean, zero, but better. Better. Yeah. Um, so we talked about this earlier, inspect the hay before feeding, mm -hmm. and you look for that three-striped three -striped blister beetle. That is a little bit hard to say. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> And then know that science was to read a poisoning. Now, I did find one company that has uh, pr produces hay, alfalfa hay nationwide, and has a pretty extensive um, quality program for ensuring that their cubes and pellets don't have blister beetles oh, okay. in them. Here's one more scary factoid: it's not just the cantharidin is not just in the beetle that's themselves but it can be released into the hay. And so if you even if you inspect and there's no blister yeah. beetle bodies, there can still be the cantharidin. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. So anyway, this is what this company says. That's good news on that one. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to go ahead and read their name because I'm reading this verbatim from their website, and I think that they are doing such a good job, they deserve the credit. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, from harvest, harvesting and manufacturing perspectives, Stanley, 
Thank you for Stanley, we yeah, sell the absolutely. apple berry cookies. Has well established QA processes at their farms, production facilities, and distribution centers to detect and eliminate insect infestations. Furthermore, Stanley's quality assurance personnel continue to be diligent and regularly contact the University of Idaho Extension offices in each county near their forward sources. So see, they contact, even they contact their um, county forward. extension office. And then, um, they harvest their forage before abundant blooms exist to provide high quality, high protein products and cut down on pests. Also, and I thought this part was really cool, Stanley Farm personnel scout fields seven to eight days prior to harvest to ensure that pests of all kinds are not present. These three striped blister beetles tend to, like if there's one adult here and there in the hay, it might not be so bad, but this insect swarms. Mm. And so if a swarm gets trapped into the alfalfa on when it's harvested, when it's cut, that's when you run into problems. Yeah. So by, by walking the fields right before they harvest. To make sure. Yeah, that was really good practice. So that's that's my answer to how can you make sure that the product you're feeding is, is quality. And to your point, Stanley does do a great job. We do sell some of their mm -hmm. treats and things like mm -hmm. that. So. so if you stick with a reputable, um, recognized uh, brand, then I think you're in great shape. Well, perfect. Well, hopefully that helps you out there. And that is it for this month's episode. So thank you guys so much for submitting your questions. And make sure to keep asking questions so we have something to answer in our next episode. You can ask your questions on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, the Smart Pack blog, and our form at smartpack.com slash questions. Just make sure to use hashtag video. So if you had a question answered in this episode or in a previous one, make sure to reach out to us at customercare at smartpack.com so you can redeem your Smart Pack gift card. So until next time, make sure to subscribe and have a great ride.